Bibles to Luke, Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22. After finishing the Passover meal, Jesus left the upper room. He led his disciples to the Mount of Olives, where they had been spending the last few nights. And, you know, just a, a few years ago, Bernice and I had the privilege of being able to go to Israel. And, and I've got to say that the, the Mount of Olives was my, my favorite place. It was the, I don't know, it was a place where God really touched me probably more than any other place because from that place you, you could view the, 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 the city of Jerusalem. You could, you could see the, the walls. You could see where the temple would have been so that in the, in the midst of this, this olive grove, you'd be able to see the lights of the city. You'd be able to, to see that. And, and I mean, it, it was the place in which Jesus was going to be, you know, um, tried and, and soon crucified. And, and I, I can't even imagine, you know, as he, as he prayed and began to look at the, uh, what was going to take place there. But, but here he, he enters this garden. And, and you could say it was at the end of a long, difficult day. At the end of a long and difficult week. And, and maybe for some of us, we can identify with that description. You ever get to one of those days where it's just been a, a long day, uh, added on to a, a, a long week? And, and, and Luke, in, in his uh, unusual, abbreviated fashion, he describes for us what occurs here on the Mount of Olives. And yet he, he makes no mention... We'll read this in a moment, but he, he makes no, no mention of the eight disciples who were left at the garden gate that we read in Matthew 26, 36. He doesn't mention the three, uh, James and Peter and John, who accompanied Jesus to the grove that we read in Matthew 26, 37. He, he doesn't mention the, the three separate times during the evening that Jesus comes and finds his disciples sleeping. On the other hand, Luke tells us, he's the only one that tells us, the sweat that dropped from Jesus was like blood as he prayed. And he alone tells us that Jesus told his disciples to pray so they wouldn't enter into temptation. And it's only Luke more than any other of the accounts that rivets our attention on the, the soul piercing anguish that Jesus was experiencing in the garden. Let's look at the scripture coming in Luke 22 verse 39 to 46. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. When he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him, and being in agony, he prayed even more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. He said to them, why, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. I think in, in this scripture, there, there are lessons about how we as individuals also have to deal with great trouble if we will um, be willing to see it. For, for we can see in this passage an example of what believers should do when they're in a time of trouble. I think that, that the first thing we knew, need to do is to get a feel for the circumstance 
that, that Jesus was in. Mark in his parallel report in, in Mark 14.33, he states that this was, was at a time when Jesus began to be troubled, deeply distressed. And Jesus' statement to his disciples, recorded in Matthew, helps us to see just how serious this situation was when he says, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. And then when Jesus says this, he says, My soul was sorrowful even unto death. This is not just a, a, an overstatement for, for some kind of effect, because Jesus was literally near death. There was something taking place in him. Do, do you know that a, a person can actually die from grief and sorrow? Jesus is in deep agony. And you, you think, well, what's the, the cause of this agony? How, how can we account for the deep agony that Jesus was undergoing in the garden? What was the reason that it can give such intense suffering? Both with, with his mother, it was a mental suffering, it was a, a physical suffering. This was some suffering that he was enduring. And there's only one satisfactory answer that we can give. The, the cause of agony was our sin. We've all experienced some kind of agony, either because of the sins of others or our own sins. And when you're in the midst of some kind of turmoil because of the relationship that we have, because of some sin, there's a great agony, isn't there? And yet here, we recognize that Jesus has our corporate sin that he's dealing with. The depth of his agony should give us some idea of our debt to Christ. How, how much he deserves of our praise. How, how much he deserves of, of our service. How much, how much our life has been paid for. Jesus was facing a fear that not only made him sweat, but his sweat actually turned to blood. In verse 44 we read, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And then he, his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. There's a scientific term for this. I, I, I won't even try to say it. But it's a, it's a rare phenomenon in, in which under great emotional stress, the, the tiny blood vessels that rupture in the sweat glands and they produce a mixture of blood and sweat. And now having seen how severe the trial that faced Jesus, I want us to see how he handled this pressure that was before him. I titled the message, When Trials Threaten to Squeeze the Life Out of Us. Well, when trials tried to strengthen or, or tried to squeeze the life out of Jesus, what did he do? Well, the first thing is that he didn't shut others out. You know, when, when things get really tough, as human beings, oftentimes we try to isolate ourselves, or we tend to isolate ourselves. We, we cut other people off from, from human contact. We, we, we withdraw into ourselves. We withdraw from others. But, but that's not what we see in the example of Jesus. Jesus didn't go it alone, and if Jesus needed others around, how much more do you think you and I do? He, he knew that he, what he was up against. And it says he, he took three of the people who were the closest to him so they would pray with him. And when the, when the going gets tough, it, it may be time to get others to help us. There's a power in partnership. Other people can hold us up in the midst of battle. They, they, they hold us up when we are weak. And so when things get cuffed, don't shut everyone out. It's Solomon, one of the wisest men in the world, wrote in Ecclesiastes this in Ecclesiastes 4.12, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A third strand is not easily broken. I think one of the verses just before that says, When two fall down, one can help the other one up. 
It's interesting. It doesn't say when one falls down, the other one can help. It. It's when they both fall down. Can you imagine? Here we are. You know, we're useless. We're, we're both down. And yet, even when two people are down, it's still better than being alone. When trials threaten to squeeze the life out of us, when trials threatened to squeeze the, the, the life out of Jesus, he didn't go it alone. The second thing is he didn't shut up his feelings either. Remember when it says in, in, in Matthew 26, 38, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. And that, that was, that, this is what he said to his disciples. Jesus was un honest about what he was struggling with. He, he didn't hide that. He, he didn't hold that. He knew what he was about to face. He had to make decisions. And he shared it with those that were closest to him. You know, sometimes we have to take a risk. And ask someone else to share in your sorrow and pain. We, we need to identify with someone, whether it's a small group of people that, that we can invite into our own garden of Gethsemane, the, the time of our deepest sorrow. When, when we're in that time of sorrow, it's not the time to shut somebody else off. It's also not the time to shut ourselves up. Amen. That doesn't mean that you go telling everybody about your problems. Prayerfully, we ask God to show us someone that can mentor us in our lives, someone that can help us in our lives, someone that can give life into that situation, someone that can encourage us to, to, to lift us up. And in, in Galatians 6 2, the Apostle Paul reminds us as believers that we're that here's our duty to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I, I fool with us sometimes and say, you know, it's like when you ask somebody how they're doing, but you really don't really want to hear them say anything. But don't you want to know there's some people <laughs> that do want you, that, that you can say something to and they'll take the time to listen? We, we are called, according to Paul here, to, to continually bear each other's burdens. The, the word burden refers to a heavy load, a difficult load, something that's difficult to carry. Jesus addressed the scribes and the Pharisees because he says, you're not willing to even lose a finger to lift a load of other people. As it's used in this scripture of bearing another's burdens, it's it represents a difficulty that we're going through. Maybe, maybe a trial that we're going through. Or something that as a person we're, we're struggling to cope with in our life. It's not being spiritual to go it alone. Actually, it's pride. God wants us to Get along with someone else. Express ourselves to someone else. Jesus didn't shut other people out. And he also didn't shut up his feelings. The third thing. He didn't try to do it his way. You know, many years ago, and I'm dating myself, although, I don't know, they keep being sightings every now and then, so maybe this generation knows who I'm talking about. Uh, Elvis Presley, you know, uh, I'm not sure if he's dead or not dead, you know, I think he's just mostly dead. Um, you know, but he, he sang a song, I Did It My Way. Remember that song? Considering how his life ended in a pill-induced stupor, alone on a bathroom floor, I find that song quite sad. And yet many people today are still trying to escape what they're dealing with. They're trying to escape their fears in a similar way. You know, some people are looking for a bottle or a bar room so they can drown their fear and they can get mind-numbing drunk, you know, so, so somehow they can put their fear on hold. 
Some people go to a, a secular counselor, but they, they, they find out that all they can give them is an earthly solution. Some people read these self-help books, but, but find what has helped others doesn't really drive the, the fear out of their own lives. Some people look to other people to solve their fear only to find out that they may have the same fear or worse ones in their own life. But there's another possibility. The psalmist says in Psalm 50 verse 15, Call on me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. And the apostle James says in James 5.13, Is any of you in trouble? He should pray. In today's text, we, we see an individual who faces a trial by turning to God. We see a person, the person of Jesus, who reveals his intense emotions to God in his prayer. And all of his emotional distress is laid down before the Father on the altar of prayer. Je Jesus did what we must do. Whenever we're faced with some great pain, whenever we're faced with some great trial, we must pray. Whether you find yourself in a hospital room, I've been finding myself there an awful lot lately, or a nursing home, a courtroom, a funeral home, and moments of prayer. They may be prayers of agony. They might be prayers of despair. But God, our Father, will hear us. Yes. Jesus takes his pain. He takes his need. He brings it to his Father in prayer. You know, you have to be careful of the danger of brooding over your own wounds. When you get caught up with the, with the busyness of life, you neglect to take the time to go to God in prayer, and then when trials are severe, they force us to our knees. In verse 44, we are told, and, and being in agony, he prayed even more earnestly. The, 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 the Greek word here means he was in anguish. He was in agony. The, the Greek word is saying, it is someone who is fighting a battle out of sheer fear. I, I want you to see that Jesus received an immediate answer to his prayer. But, but in a, a somewhat unexpected way. Because God the Father did not remove the cup. But he sent an angel to minister to him. <laughs> Rather than telling him that he should avoid the cross, God sends an angel to feed him. To encourage him. Jesus isn't spared the trial. But he supplied the strength to face the trial. He, he's not lifted out of the trial, but he's given the strength and the encouragement to go through it. It's interesting to me that after the angel came is when he sweat blood. He, he prayed more earnestly. It was like the Spirit of God gave him additional strength to persevere in his own walk so that he would be able to go through the process of prayer. When trials threaten to squeeze the life out of Jesus, he didn't shut others out. He didn't shut his feelings up. He, he didn't try to do it his way. And a fourth thing is this. He didn't decide to be disobedient. The second half of verse 42, this is what we read. Nevertheless, not my will, yours be done. Jesus had prayed if there'd be any other way that mankind could be saved from their sins. That was his desire. But only if that was the will of the Father. 
and, and greater than his fear, greater than his loathing for his task ahead of him was his overriding desire to please God the Father. The, the, the greatest good we can do is to do the will of God. To please God. Whatever the cost involved. If you're in a crisis of disobedience, or, or I should say in a crisis of obedience, it's all right to tell God you're reluctant. It's not like he doesn't already know that. Just make sure that, that, that when you do, that you do what he tells you to do in spite of your reluctance. Courage is not the absence of fear. It's action despite fear. It's a terrible thing to, to find out the people that, that you counted on disappoint you. But verse 45 tells us that at last Jesus got up from praying. How long he was struggling in prayer, I don't know. But it was late. And when he went out to his disciples, he found them sleeping again. The Gospel accounts it in Matthew and Mark tell us that he did so three times during the evening. He kept returning back to his disciples. And I, I don't know if he was looking to say, hey man, are you guys still with me? Are, are you guys still, are, are you helping to support? Are, are you undergirding? You know, man, I, this, is the, this is the greatest trial of my life, but I want to know that you're with me. Only Luke tells us the disciples were sleeping from sorrow. Maybe they were beginning to get a glimpse of what was before Jesus. Maybe they were beginning to get a glimpse of the fact that when Jesus said that he had to go to the cross, when Jesus said that he would be lifted up, when, when Jesus said that, that he would have to give his life, that, that, that a kernel of wheat must go into the ground in order for it to bring forth fruit. Maybe they were beginning to get a, a sense of what was taking place, but they were overcome with sorrow. Anyone who has suffered some kind of a, a deep depression knows that when deep depression comes upon a person, you, you have a, a, a desire, an inordinate desire to sleep things away. The Lord's final admonition to his disciples to pray in verse 46. In the original Greek, it's a present tense. In its context, he's suggesting that their prayer is to be an ongoing commitment to pray as opposed to a single moment of prayer. Don't just pray now. Keep praying. Don't stop now. Keep Make this before the Lord. You know, then he says to them, why do you sleep? Rise up and pray lest you enter into temptation. How many times have we become overcome in the midst of our trial? Or, or we question these words like, why this happened to me? Why, 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 why? You're overcome. Why? Because sorrow has overtaken your heart. But by faith, we need to rise up and pray. Maybe for some of you at this moment in your life might be the most difficult trial of your life. I want to ask you some questions. Have you brought loved ones, trusted friends in to help you or have you isolated yourself? Are there others that can help? Are there others that can come and understand? Are there others that can help speak to that situation? Or are you going it alone? Have you honestly expressed your feelings or, or do you believe that you just put up a false front in front of everybody. Past couple of weeks, I've just been really troubled. Not, not just with... We are ministering to people as they're going through different issues, but, but the, the international scene is just... I don't know why it's troubled me so bad. I saw somebody post something yesterday, uh, you know, kind of a, a funny comical thing that they said between Vladimir Putin and the president. And, you know, it was like, you know, this, this thing. It was a pastor, actually. And, you know, how, how, how you know, this was a funny thing. And, and, and my heart is breaking for people that are in Ukraine. To me, it's not funny. 
It's not a funny thing when you're just mocking leaders, when you understand that, that there, are, there are people's lives in the balance. And, and just because you change one name of one country to another country, don't you realize that you come under the, the, the administration of that country? So therefore, there are churches that are no longer registered. There, there are pastors that now will be put in jail. There, 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 there are properties that will be confiscated. There, there's a bigger thing here than what we're just reading in the news. The, the kingdom of God is hanging in the balance. And there are people of God that, 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 that are involved in this. There are families that are involved in this. And, and just what you read isn't all that's happening. Are we honest to express our feelings? If you're sad, it's okay to look sad. It's okay to share that sadness with other people. C come on, we we're a body of Christ. Right? We the body says that we rejoice with those that rejoice and we also mourn with those that mourn. Have you taken your problems to God? Have you asked other people to pray for you as well? Are you being obedient to God's leading in your life? Or are you using the difficulties in your life to use it as an excuse to run from God? You know, grapes are easily crushed. But it's not so with olives. Olives are hard. Olives are tough. It requires more pressure to produce oil from an olive than it is to get juice from a grape. And many people today want the anointing of God without the press of God. Can I tell you it's not possible? What we have to do is say, Lord, let your press produce the oil in my life. Let your press produce the oil in my life. When you go through difficulties, when it seems like life just, you know, the trials and the circumstances of life want, want to suck the very life, squeeze the life out of you. Don't go it alone. Invite someone in. Don't shut up your feelings. Share those feelings. Don't walk in disobedience, but, but obey what God has for you. Don't walk from God, but walk to Him. If we pray, we will not be overcome by temptation. But if we do not pray, we'll be overcome by temptation. God has placed us in a body. If we focus on our own part to the exclusion of the body, we build fragmentation. If we can see that there's unity and there's value in my brothers and sisters, that means they can also be help. They can be support. And if we will do our part, now we're able to build up the whole. I, I want to encourage you this morning. I know many people have gone through things. And may maybe your life right now is like, man, things are, the, are really great. A and praise God for that. Someday there'll be something that's going to come to squeeze the olive, you know. But how will you respond? Not my will, but your will. I thank God that in the midst of Jesus' travail, God sent him an angel. And the angel strengthened him. Not to divert off course, but to stay on course. Not to do his own thing, but to do God's thing. And then he strengthened him for that. I trust that God's grace is sufficient for us in whatever season we go through.
that he will enable us, that he will strengthen us, that we can have that kind of trust in God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray and prepare for our communion. If the ushers could hand out the communion elements, please. Father, we come before you today. And Lord, we ask that even as we share in this communion meal, it's always to remind us of what you have done. It's also to remind us our own place, that we're one piece of bread. We're not the whole loaf. And Lord, we belong to each other. And, and Lord, real relationships are open. Real relationships are honest. Real relationships allow us to be vulnerable to each other. Not to the world, but to a few. Lord, I pray that you would just do a great work in our lives. That, Lord, if anyone came in today burdened, Lord, that you lift that burden from them. And, Lord, if, if they continue to be heavy, that they would understand there's a way out to be joined with others. Open up their lives to allow you to go to you in prayer, to choose to be obedient. That if we would do these things, we would be strengthened for the walk you've given us to walk. We'd be given an enablement to be obedient to you. Father, I thank you. Thank you for the life of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you walked to the cross. Thank you, Lord, that you persevered for us, that you didn't just sleep it off, that you didn't isolate yourself. What great grace. What great grace was seen in your life. May that grace be seen in ours as well. Who would strengthen us today as we examine ourselves we ask you Lord heal us strengthen us cause us to be closer as a body help us love one another and even when we have to bear some pain may we be reminded of the pain that you bore for us and in so doing, we can identify with you. And we can give you greater praise. I thank you, Lord, that you're always with us. You never leave us. You never forsake us. But Lord, as we turn to you, you can strengthen us. Father, I pray for families today. Lord, that you would deliver what's necessary to be delivered. That you will heal what's necessary to be healed. Lord, that, that you will build whatever communication needs to be built. Lord, that, that you would redeem the years that the locust has devoured. Lord, that you would let love flow like never before. Let, let peace be experienced because things have been communicated and forgiven. Oh, we bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. And whatever we can do to be at peace with others, Lord, let that be done in our lives. We just bless you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We take this bread and we're reminded of what you've done for us. We're reminded, Lord, that you are broken for us. Lord, let the same humility that was in your mind that was, that was willing to, you were willing to give up your throne in heaven and come here, walk this walk. Lord, to, to be misunderstood by men, to be crucified for our own sin. Didn't follow your will, but you followed the Father's will. And you walked this walk to please him and to redeem us. May it be reminded in our life, Lord, that we should follow after your example. We want to bless you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Lord, we take this cup, a cup that is your covenant, a re reminder of your covenant that you've made with us. The reality is this, is that you are faithful, even when we're not. We're reminded, Lord, and we come back to it, just like when we go to a wedding, and we hear a bride and a groom make their vows, we're reminded of the vows that we made. And Lord, that reminder should bring us closer to keeping the vow we made. When we share in this communion meal, Lord, we recognize that you promised to give us a new heart, but you also called us to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. And so, Lord, as we share in this cup today, we're reminded and we ask you, Lord, help us, God, by your spirit to walk worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, where we have made offense, may we ask forgiveness. Lord, where we have wronged you, may we ask you, Lord, to forgive us. And Lord, as we come before you today, we walk clean because of the work you've done. And therefore, Lord, the same forgiveness that we've received, may we also merit out that same forgiveness to those around us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we just want to thank you for this great day. It's the day that you've made. It's a day that we have opportunity to love one another. It's a day that we have the opportunity to pray for one another. It's a day that we have opportunity to listen to one another. It's a day that you've made that we can hug one another, that we can show genuine love to each other. Lord, let your ministry flow through each one of us today and every day of our lives, we pray, as we go even from this place, in Jesus' name, amen. Stand with us, please.